You can take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 as we are going to finish the second part. Last week we could not get through it all. So this week we intend to do so. What do you imagine when you think of heaven? What is it that comes into your mind? What's, what's the picture? Is it of clouds and harps and angels and singing forever? To some that sounds wonderful and appealing, while others would consider that awful and horrible. The song I can only imagine tries to capture the wonderment and the curiosity of what will heaven be like when he writes, I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side, what my eyes would see when your face is before me. Surrounded by your glory, he writes, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah or will I be able to even speak at all. What is heaven going to be like when we stand before the almighty creator? Others may think of heaven as a place where they will do all the things they like to do here on earth, but with much more success and joy, such as fishing is the fishing hole that you catch something every time or or golfing you hear this many times after at a funeral that oh it's going to be golfing and it's going to be getting hole in one or maybe it's bowling and they're and they're bowling perfect games all the time in other words heaven really is created in their image and it's really all about doing what they do here on life but they're just having more success at it they're enjoying it more what we've done when we do that and think that way is we really have made heaven centered on us, our joy, our satisfaction, and our happiness. And it's not surprising, since many who profess Christ, Jesus, salvation, and the church is really about seeking your happiness, your fulfillment, and seeking to find salvation. In other words, you want to know what Jesus can do for you. What can the church do for me? And many times, church... Salvation, the gospel, Jesus is just another solution to a problem or another thing that you need to fit to make your life the way that you want it to be. And many times, just as we're guilty of making God into our own image, we have made heaven into our own. I think there are many times, unfortunately, maybe some, hopefully not, who will be disappointed at first when they get to heaven and see what it is like. I bring this up because last week, Peter had been reminding his readers that one day that the heavens will pass away, the sky and all of the universe. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and most, most uh, 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 not encouraging, but discouraging or, or something to understand is that the earth and all the works done on it will be exposed. Dr. Thomas Schreiner writes that the destruction described is total and complete, involving a burning of the present elements of the world. Nothing will survive this sovereign decision of our Lord. Twice in our passage of last week and today, Peter writes that the world will be dissolved. He wants to be crystal clear with both the believers who he's trying to encourage and the false teachers who he is warning. The end is coming. The world will be set ablaze and be dissolved. Peter writes that this does, doesn't write this not just to satisfy our curiosity, but to note the certainty that one day God will judge the world and judge the wicked, excuse me, and reward the faithful. In pointing out the error of the false teachers and their distorted theology, Peter, like Joshua, is asking those who profess Christ, who will you serve today? Life is full of choices that have real world consequences in the here and now, but also in the internal. There are eternal consequences for the choices you and I make in this life. The wise King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he said, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. 
Peter clearly points out that those who ignore God's word, who dismiss the predictions of the prophets, who distort the teachings of Jesus and disparage the instructions of the apostles will face judgment. The judgment of the wicked will commence at God's good pleasure and in his perfect timing. The apostle Paul had warned in Romans chapter 2 that because of your hand or your hard and an impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, speaking of the rebellious children against God. He says you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and he will render to each one according to to his work. So our choices in life, the things that we do, the things that we think, the things that we omit doing one day will be set before him. However, the reward of the faithful will be a joyous reunion when Christ returns as he's promised. The writer of Hebrew promises us this, that Christ, having been once offered for the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And we talked about eagerly waiting last week. Now, while we wait during this extended delay, this extended delay has now been almost 2,000 years long. Peter calls his readers to live in eager expectation and eager desire for the second coming. And I bring you to our attention of last week's message for that. We are to eagerly wait and eagerly anticipate, eagerly expect and desire for Christ to come again. And we have learned from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones that there are three things to do while we wait during that delay. You and I are to prepare ourselves by renouncing worldliness and worldly passions. We are to live self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age. So right now, you and I are to be preparing ourselves for heaven, for the new heaven and the new kingdom, for the rewards that are those for the faithful. We are also, number two, to preach the gospel and make disciples of every nation, tribe, and tongue. We're looking at this in our adult core class. I would encourage you to join with us so we understand what God has called us to do to be on mission. And then thirdly, this is more so a mind and a heart condition, is that we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you and I, our work should include these three things, your calendar, your, your financial statements, the things that you do, how you decide what you're going to do should include these three things as we prepare for the day when Christ comes. And until that day, Peter had asked his readers in our passage today, what sort of people ought you to be? And we saw that we are to be people who are are pursuing godliness and holiness. Now this week, we want to consider the motivation for pursuing a life of holiness and godliness. And that's the promises of a new heaven and a new earth. So with that, let's read 2 Peter 3, 11-13. It's in your Bible. It's also on the monitors if you need so. But look at it as we go once again. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved... What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? That's the question. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. There's there's the choice there. If you do not serve God, that is what waits for you. Dissolved. The world set ablaze. But in verse 13, but according to his promises, you and I are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And we pray that you open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us. Father, may we be encouraged by your word. May we be challenged by the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, change our minds and our concept of how we live today. Shake us to the core this morning. Let us not leave this building the same as we were today in heart and mind, but be challenged and encouraged. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. What Peter is doing here is he's urging Christians to pursue godliness and holiness now. 
So many of us think, well, when I get to heaven, then I'll be perfect. When I get to heaven, then I'll be able to do all the things that God wants me to do. But right now I, I'm weak. The flesh is weak. We sung as that in the song, uh, I asked the Lord that I might grow. And we see that our hearts are weak. Our hearts betray us. So why not enjoy life? It is so difficult to continually fight sin, is it not? So what is wrong with me just having and enjoying just a little bit of sin? For God's grace is great, the apostle tells us, and God will forgive all things. So let's enjoy a few things of life. Let's have just a few pet sins. Let's put some of the sins into tributes. I won't do them all the time. I'll just do them once in a while when I need it, when I'm lonely, when I'm tired, when I'm exhausted, when I'm sad. Let me just have a few of these things. Sanctification is something that happens in heaven. However, Scripture tells us that sanctification is happening now. When you and I pursue holiness and godliness, it's where God is making us into the image of the Son. And yes, what He has purposed to do, Romans 8, 28 tells us, He will do. But yet we're to pursue that in the here and now. Life is full of choices. So we're to pursue godliness and holiness now, for this world will melt away under the judgment of God. But he also goes on, goes on to state that not only will this world be destroyed, but you and I need to understand that it also takes a new one or a new one takes its place. Look again in verse 13. God has given us a promise that you and, our wait, you and I are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter earlier in this chapter had laid down the foundation of the person and the character of God. One of which was that we can trust God because he is faithful and will fulfill his promise. Landon shared little of that in his, in his pastor's prayer with us. God is faithful. He hears the prayers of his people. Now Peter writes good news that you and I must be reminded of and that you and I must embrace as we tackle this world that is hostile to our faith. God is not just going to destroy this world and leave you and I hanging. Unlike the teachings of the false teachers that teach that this life is all that there is, enjoy it now, this is all you can expect, God is not asking you and I to abandon all the pleasures of this world for nothing. And many times we feel that way. God is just legalistic. God is just a God of rules. God just doesn't want me to have fun. I've heard these sayings, especially as a youth leader. As kids would say, I just don't want to accept Christ because I just want to enjoy life. But yet adults were the same way. No, he promises us something so much better. He promises a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I want us to consider that this morning. Pastor John MacArthur writes that this promise of a new universe is rooted in the Old Testament. And the word new means new in quality, not just in chronological, in chronologi I'm not going to be able to say, not just new in time. When Peter writes that righteousness dwells, he means that the universe is new in quality because righteousness has settled in and has taken up permanent and exclusive resonance. No more is there sin. No more is there death. No more is there injustice. This is new in quality. Please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 20. For it is there we're going to spend the majority and the most of our time this morning. For it's important for you and I to get acquainted with what God has revealed to the Apostle John concerning the judgment of the wicked and the rescue of the godly in the last days. First, I want to start with the judgment of the wicked in chapter 20, looking at verse 11. John has this picture, this vision of heaven. And he writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky flew away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Verse 13. 
Then the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to what they have done twice. He has mentioned this, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the record, in, written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What you and I must understand, that hell, that the lake of fire is the final resting place. And you and I must understand that this lake of fire is real. It is eternal. It is constant. It is a conscious punishment with no end. There is a reality. reality. Life has choices which has consequences. You see, there is no hope for those who reject Christ. The false teachers will stand condemned with no excuse and no escape. To choose to have your best life now will leave you receiving the full wrath of God. To enjoy the pleasures of this world rather than the pleasures of God will leave you judged as unworthy to enter his kingdom. That's why Paul writes to the Corinthian church, you may see it here on the monitor. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is what he's telling us. But let me warn you here. You may say, well, whew, I'm okay because I am not actively doing those things. I am not participating in those things. But from the teachings of Jesus... He points out it's not just the actual, the physical actions, but it's the heart. And if you and I were to say, as David did, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way, I think he would show the ways in which idolatry, adultery, thieving and stealing, and anger and hatred is in our hearts. So you and I must pursue godliness and holiness for without it, we will not see the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. You cannot follow the examples of the false teachers and escape judgment. If our profession of faith is true, then you and I must pursue holiness and godliness, eagerly expecting and desiring the coming of Christ. Why? Because the rescue of the godly, the reward of the faithful, is a promise of a new heaven and a new earth. You and I must see that. I'm here not only to challenge you, but to encourage you this morning. Is there a motivation? There's reward for fighting sin. For saying no to Satan. To saying no to the passions of the flesh. To flee from them. And you and I must understand this. Look at Revelation chapter 21 as we go into the next chapter. For we see what is awaiting those who are wicked, those who live for today, those who reject Christ, rebel against God's holy rule. But in Revelation 21, starting with verse 21, John gives a beautiful picture for those that have accepted Christ, those that have hear, heard the voice of God and have responded to his call to follow him. To those who have abandoned all and follow Christ, he says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and the sea was no more. And that's an important phrase. We may get to that a little bit. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared for a bride adorned for her husband. You may want to underline that if you're one who likes to do that. And I heard a, Lord, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Emmanuel, God with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the promise of the Old Testament here. Verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anywhere. For the former things, again, what does he say? Have passed away. And he say, he that was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write, 
this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let me share with you the new heavens and the new earth. The heaven that you and I are looking for, our eternal inheritance that Peter wrote in First and Second Peter is not some ethereal little cloud where we're floating around and just playing harps. No. It's not just a spiritual place where, angel, where we have angel wings and hearts, but a physical reality with a physical earth, a physical kingdom, with physical healing and restoration. God will be with us. No longer will the earth groan or the sons of God groan for redemption, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. It is the consummation of all of redemption and salvation as we are brought back to the state of the garden and is in the beginning. What God had promised Adam and Eve finds its root there. What he promised Abraham finds its solution. What he promised Isaiah and Jeremiah and Israel and the nations finds its promise in the new heavens and the new earth. And just take a look real quickly again as we look at that passage. <coughs> the new earth is described as a, as a bride prepared, adorned for her husband. Now so for some of you, this might become a little bit more um, uh, understanding as you just uh, watched the, the royal wedding yesterday. Think of that picture and how beautiful she was. The time that is spent with any bride as she presents herself before her husband. The pomp and the circumstance, the beauty of the ceremony, the beauty of, of all the decorations and all that goes in it. The purity, the commitment, the permanence. God says as he is preparing us, as we see in Ephesians 5, the wedding here that we have now and we experience as husband and worth, as husband and wife just points to the reality of the church being prepared for his bride. We are being washed. We are being prepared. And as he looks at it, it says, there will be a day when you and I will be in purity. That means our minds and our hearts will no longer desire the things of the flesh. But we will have eyes for nothing but our, our, our husband, Jesus Christ. Not only that, Dawn is not here at the moment. She's teaching Sunday school. But one of the most th wonderful things she loves to do at a wedding is that when everyone sees and turns to the bride and watches her approach, Dawn wants to see the, 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 the husband, the husband-to-be. She wants to see the groom because she wants to see his eyes when he first lays eyes on his bride. I remember doing that with you guys and you just see it. And I don't know if you've ever seen some of those videos where you see sometimes the man just, he just loses it. He falls apart. And I'm about to fall apart now. But could you imagine? When I think about Jesus coming today, I, I struggle. I truly don't want Jesus to see me as I am. I don't want you to see me. I don't want my wife to see me who I truly am. That's why we work and we hide and we wear our mask on Sunday. But there is going to be a day, people, where we're going to be walking down the aisle. And I'm giving you an analogy, obviously. I don't know what exactly. But Jesus is going to be looking at us in purity, in love, in acceptance. You don't feel that way, but we will. And Jesus is going to follow us with loving eyes as we come down and the Father takes our hands and put us together. Have you ever considered that? That's the motivation. That's what our sanctification is about. What a wonderful day that will be. I yearn for Jesus to look at me like that. I know some of you here may be single today. And some of your desire, and I see it every once in a while. And I see the phrase, I wish somebody would look at me like he or she is looking at them. My prayer is that you do. My prayer is that God's common grace will share that gift for you. And it is a wonderful thing. When I see Landon and I hold him and I look at the pictures and how he looks at me and how he looks at Brandon or when he looks at Paige, and he grabs her face, look at me. When Jesus looks at us, it is going to be the most wonderful, awesome thing. 
That ought to get you up in the morning. For God loves you now like he's going to love you then, even in all of your impurity today. Thank you. So that should get us up. That should encourage us and challenge us. And I didn't mean to speak so much on that, on that one point, because I have quite a few after that. But we will be coming as a bride prepared, adorned for her husband. Not only that, God will once again dwell with his people as he did in the garden, as he walked in the cool of the day. And he will not be saying, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Well, we hid from you, but no, we will be running as children who hear the voice of their father running into his arms. Our relationship will be consummated as we will be his people and in our God. Again, giving us the thing of a marriage being consummated. It should not be set apart, hence why he hates divorce. You and I must recognize this. Why? Because it points to a greater spiritual reality is there will be no divorce. God will no longer uh, uh, put his people away as he did Israel, but he will bring them back and they will be together. God will restore, renew, and remove. There will be no more sin. There'll be no more sickness. We will put those away. God will be faithful to his promise. We yearn for this. In verse 5, we saw that God will be faithful to his promises to us. Most important, the holy triune God will be in all of his glory. You and I just see God through scripture and through others. We see through a glass darkly, but as Paul, uh, Paul said, one day we will see him fully. What a wonderful day. But here's a warning. Justin Peters, a Christian apologist, he tweeted this. And it's a sober reminder. I hope we may have this. It is there. It's on the monitor. Listen to what he says. It is good and it is right to want deliverance from hell. And unfortunately, many times, that's what we present the gospel as. We present salvation as a get out of hell free card. It's fire insurance. But listen to what he says. But just as much as you as I should want deliverance from hell, we should want deliverance from sin. The man who wants deliverance from the former but not from the latter has deliverance from neither. See, you and I so many times have made friends with our sin. And let me tell you, you need to abandon it now and today. You need to see it that this is not something that you're taking with you to heaven. Don't hold on to it. Say, well, I'll get rid of it then. No, you get rid of it now. But let me also say this. If all you want in heaven is all the things that you experience here on earth, but just in a greater detail, but you don't want Christ, then I would challenge you to speak your heart. For we could take all these other things and if we just had Christ, we would be full of joy. So don't desire just the gifts of God without the gifts of who the person is. The Daily Wire, an internet news site, wrote an article about Coco Istanbuluva. And if I misspelled that or misspoke it, I'm sorry, but she's the oldest living woman at 128. She is described as one who listens from her own word. She survived the Russian Civil War the Second World War, the deportation of her people in 1944 and the two Chechen wars. She also said that she met Vincent van Gogh, whether he had one ear or two, I do not know, when she was a girl. According to the Russian government, she is the oldest living person in the world, but despite all this time on a planet, she says that she has never experienced a single happy day in her life. She goes on to state that as a Muslim in a constant state of oppression, that long life is not at all God's gift for me. That's a quote, but a punishment. She goes on to say, quote, I have not had a single happy day in my life. I have always worked hard digging in the garden. I am tired. I survived through these wars, the deportation of our nation, and through two other checking awards. I am now sure that my life was not a happy one. Looking back at my unhappy life, she says this, I wish I had died when I was young. I worked all of my life. I did not have time for rest or entertainment. 
Her theology, Islam, she's a Muslim, held, holds no hope or joy for her in the, dis, in, the, in the dismal portion of life she has. She has outlived all of her children and most of her grandchildren and great children. Life is nothing but toil and trouble. However, the Christian has hope in the new earth. We can experience the suffering and the toils of life because we have something much wonderful to look at, to consider, to hope for. Let us continue in verse 6 of chapter 21 of Revelation. For John says, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Magus, just as God speaking, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, he promises, I will give them spring from the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Here in the new heavens and the new earth, you and I will find true satisfaction. As God fulfills all that we need. Whatever the promises of Satan that sin offers you, God says it will not suffice. I will give you what you truly need. We will have no more thirst. You and I will now be conquerors with a heritage with God as our father. Those who are not satisfied with God in this present world will not find satisfaction in the next. Those who are faithful though will enjoy an eternal relationship with God as our father. You must understand that. As difficult as the Christian life is, and it is difficult, we too many times have shared the Christian life as an easy road. Just believe. Just say yes, Jesus. And that's all you need. But it's so much more than that. Follow with me now as we drop down to verse 22 of that chapter. John writes, And I saw no temple in the city, For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of a sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, speaking really of what we were talking about earlier in Isaiah. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This kingdom, God promises, will be filled with God's righteousness and justice. And at our heart, this is what you and I yearned for, God's righteousness and his justice. We need a savior, a king who will rule in righteousness and justice. There will be peace among the nations. There will be no war. There will be no conflict. All the nations will live together with joy and love and understanding. Our world right now is being torn apart by conflict. Whether we're looking overseas or whether we're looking in just our own politics, on our own culture, or even in our own homes, there's conflict. But one day, there will be peace. I don't know about you, but I long for that. No more conflict, just peace. God's justice, God's righteousness. All its nations and its rulers will bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God promised this to Israel as we read in our scripture reading, but yet it was not fulfilled in their days. Why? Because their hearts were not right. But God says it will be filled in the millennium and in the new heavens and the earth as we work our way towards us as Jesus himself reigns. And during the millennium and then gives himself to the Father. And all things come under and peace and righteousness will rule. There'll be no disparity. There'll be no lack. There'll be no injustice. There'll be no racism. There'll be no sin. Truly what Isaiah the prophet wrote will be finally realized. That from old no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for them. That's what's informing Peter here. 
when he says pursue holiness and godliness. And during this delay, wait with eager anticipation and expectation. Have an eager desire in your heart that he would come quickly. Remove your heart from this world. Jesus himself taught us not to put our, 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 our treasure where the things can be destroyed, but in a place in heaven where it's lasting for eternity. And that where our heart is, that's where our treasure is. So where is it? Is it here in the things of the earth as the false teachers? In living your life now, enjoying it? Or are you pursuing the godliness and holiness that God says that his divine power has granted to you. You have a choice today. God or yourself. Who he live for. Choices have consequences. You can strive to satisfy your appetite with the pleasures of this world. Or you can strive to satisfy your appetite with the promises of God. I pray that all that hear my voice will strive after the things of God. For there you will find your hunger filled. There you'll find your thirst satisfied. I pray that you will choose God. Let you and I, let us not be so wrapped up in the affairs of this world that we forget, neglect, or ignore the promise of Christ's return. You and I should be living that he may be coming at any moment. Let us put our hope in the coming of Christ to redeem his people and our inheritance in the new kingdom. You and I must understand, though, here's the warning, is that it's not our good works. Yes, we will be judged by our good works, but yet that will not save us. We are saved for good works. It's how we live out the commandment of loving God and loving our neighbors. It is an evangelistic tool as a way in which we worship God. But let me tell you, if you're here today and say, all right, I will do those things, but I'll do them without Christ, you too are without hope. For the Bible tells us that you can cast out demons, you can heal the, 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 the suffering of many people and still be rejected by Christ. Let it not be so. For good works in itself will not get you into heaven. Hence the gospel. Israel could not do it by keeping the law. You yourself cannot do it by keeping the law yourself. And so I would call you to come to Christ. Now as I look out, many of you have made that, that decision. Many of you have committed that. You've shared your testimony. So I want to challenge you to just live that out. If you have not come to Christ so that you may have that inheritance, that he may give you his power to live out the life of holiness and godliness. The words of Peter here are difficult. Wait and hasten the day of Christ. It's not going to be easy to live lives of godliness and holiness during this delay. It's going to cost you. And that's what I just want to tell you today. So many times again, we present Christ as a life without cost, but it will cost you. Jesus said, count the cost to come follow me. You must give up all to follow me. What are you holding in reserve? Are you ready to abandon it all to, to follow him? Are you ready to give it all to him? I pray that you do so. Let us hold on to the promise of God that's found in 1 Corinthians. It's here on the monitor. And here he's using the words of Isaiah. He says, as it is written, what I, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What has he prepared? The new heavens and the new earth. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, which we saw through our, our New City Catechism, in which the Spirit comes and convicts us of sin. He regenerates us. He helps us to fight sin. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Let me close with this. Let us with eager expectation and anticipation and desire be prepared for the coming of Christ one old gospel song captures our hope and joy. It's called, What a Day That Will Be. One of my favorite old times. Listen to what the writer says. There is coming a day when no heartaches shall come. 
There'll be no clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, a glorious day that will be. What a day that will be, he goes on to write, when my Jesus I shall see and I shall look upon his face. I can imagine the same as we walk into that atrium and we see Christ, the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and he leads me through the promised land. What a day and glorious day that will be. He writes, there'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. There is no death. Forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Until that day, will you take the words of Peter and be encouraged, motivated to pursue holiness and godliness with total radical abandonment. Until that day, let us prepare ourselves for his coming. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, and let us not forget that we're here together until that day to encourage and lift one another up. With every head bowed and every eye closed as the worship team comes forward, I want you to consider these words of Scripture. What is your motivation this morning? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Are you fleeing sin? Are you fighting sin or have you made friends? If you have, would you repent? Confess and come running to our Lord who is willing to embrace you and to forgive you? Would you consider what God has prepared for you? That even the life of suffering and struggle that you have today is to make you fit to be ready for that wonderful day when you and I are unified with him. Let's be encouraged for that. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And I pray that whatever you may be calling each and every one to do, it may some, it may be come to Christ for the very first time. I pray that they would hear your voice, that they would abandon all, repent of their sin and turn towards you and follow you. Father, there's still some here that have done that, but yet they're still struggling in their sin. They're, they're still deciding whether or not to abandon that sin. I pray that you would convict them this morning. Do not let them leave without that, that uh, finished in their mind to, to chase after godliness and holiness. Prepare us for that wonderful day. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.